and raised me to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Prayed with me, taught me things about Christ that um, put that interest in my heart to pursue and learn more about Him when I became an adult and finally trusted Christ as my Savior. So thank the Lord for mothers. I hope you had a good day. Today we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Um, I appreciate the adults that take a part in trying to help with the children here too. That's a blessing. We do have, um, uh, like Brother Stone said, we have Master's Club on Wednesday night. For, and then on uh, Sunday morning we have a junior church. But, but Sunday night uh, we don't have those special activities for the children. Maybe as we grow and keep growing... Um, we can provide something like that on Sunday night as well. I don't, I don't know. It's something to pray about. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. The Bible said, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus and to the church of Thessal uh, the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all making mention of of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Now, notice this now, verse 3, your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. As ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, and ye became followers of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the, from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Uh, that's a short chapter, just ten verses in chapter number one. But we're talking tonight uh, about some characteristics of the church that made it so ideal and such a joy to Paul's heart. You ever heard this? Um, yeah, I know you've heard. If uh, you ever find the perfect church, don't join. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? If you find the perfect church, don't join. Because if you join, it'll be imperfect. You know, you've heard that. Well, there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. And there is no perfect local assembly. No perfect local assembly. You can even read of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapter number two and three. And you'll find there's only one church out of those seven that the Lord didn't have to reprimand about some situation. If you'll notice the letters of Paul, uh, not only to the Thessalonians, but to the Corinthians and the, and the, uh, the Colossians, uh, there was an element of rebuke in some, especially in 1 Corinthians. Man alive. Um, uh, if you'll read 1 Corinthians, there were several things that Paul had to actually reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine to try to get them back in line where they needed to be. Uh, so if, uh, again, you see the perfect church, there's no perfect church. Uh, then don't join. You've heard that old expression. Uh, the Bible even tells us in the book of Matthew in chapter number 13 about the parable of the mustard seed, how that it started out a small little seed and then it flowered out and then you remember the, the ravens come and lodge therein. Well, it started out small and then as it grew, of course, ravens represent uh, satanic doctrine or Satan and they come and lodge therein. And then you have the parable of the sheep and the goats and the tares and the wheats and they're going to stay there. The tares are going to be in with the wheats till the Lord comes back and separates them himself, isn't it? So, but we love our church. Now, just because the church is imperfect does not mean that we shouldn't be a part of it. We are a part of it. Someone was asking me the other day, I don't know, I think it was Kenny maybe, uh, in Bible study, we have Bible study at 7.30 every morning uh, for you that's just coming to the Faith Baptist Church. If you'd like to be a part of that, 7.30 to 8.30, Monday through Friday in the, in the old auditorium. And also we have a Bible college and it's um, uh, actu actually classes have finished for the, um, uh, the semester. But when they start again, Brother Donnell? Last week of June. We have our summer sessions in June and then in August, right?
Okay, and then we have our next year starting in the fall. So if anyone's interested in Faith Bible College, it is a, it is a wonderful Bible college. It is a Bible college. Amen. And distinguished from being uh, from liberal arts, it is a strictly Bible college, and it is one of the soundest Bible colleges anywhere in the South, anywhere in the anywhere in the world. Let me say that, anywhere in the world. So you be a part of it. I don't know where I was going with that. Just putting a plug in there for the Bible college. I think is what I was doing. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> Amen, Amen. But anyway, uh, talking about the churches, the church. Now we need to be a part of the church. And um, uh, so the local assembly, and when the local assembly is what Je Jesus Christ, Christ died for the church, and when people say, and you know this is one of my pet peeves, I'm a very strong local church pastor, when anyone says, talks about the invisible church, you know what I tell them? I said, I've never seen one. Pretty profound, isn't it? Never seen an invisible church. The local, the local assembly is, what is the manifestation of God's church. Those that have been born again, baptized, uh, in, in the, by the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, into the body, we're the church. And that's the letter that Paul is sending to a local church. Paul's not sending this letter to an invisible church. He's sending it to a, very, a local assembly of born-again believers, just like gathered here tonight at the Faith Baptist Church in Milton, Florida. Now, so, um, uh, nevertheless, the church at Thessalonica was a good church. You know, there's no church is perfect, but some churches are closer to New Testament ideas than others. And again, the church at Thessalonica was in this category. At least three times in this particular letter, Paul gave thanks for the church and the way it responded to the truth. Not only to the truth, but to the one preaching the truth. The Bible says in chapter 1, verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all. He was a southerner, wasn't he? Amen. For you all, y'all. Uh, making mention of you in our prayers. And then in chapter number 2 and verse number 13. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing. Again, Paul making mention of them in our prayers by the way that they responded to the truth. And then if you'll notice in chapter 3 verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. So Paul was happy with the church. This was a good church. The church at Thessalonica was a very good church. Now, if we'll notice the characteristics of this particular church that, again, made it so ideal and such a joy to the heart of Paul, they were a saved people, number one. They were a saved people in chapter number one. I like what Mrs. Kelly read a while ago about the priest getting saved. Well, after he got saved, they didn't want him. You know, now we amen, praise the Lord. You can get a Jehovah Witness saved, and we'll just jump up and down for joy and praise the Lord. You get a Mormon saved, we'll just get excited. Praise the Lord. You get a Pentecostal saved, we'll do, well, hallelujah, thank God they got saved. But you let an independent Baptist church preacher get saved in the independent Baptist church ranks. You'd think everybody would be happy, Brother Joe. Don't you think we'd rather have a saved preacher than a lost preacher? Amen. Some, you know, there's a, some preachers need to get saved. There's some preachers need to get saved. There's some missionaries need to get saved. Not everyone that names the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is saved. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because they're dependent on their good works instead of what Jesus Christ has done in Calvary to get them to heaven. Now, anyway, they were a saved people. Salvation begins with God. It's born in the very heart of God. It's born in the heart of God. Look at First Thessalon I mean, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Salvation begins with God. In other words, it's born. Salvation is born in the very heart of God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Listen to this now. This is going to settle a lot of questions in your heart as we go back to the election of God there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let me, let me start again in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Is that a hard verse? That's the way God chose people to get saved. Sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't cause people to get saved by repeating some manufactured words that a man created 
so that man could feel better, the altar worker could feel better, the Lord said that the world is chosen to be saved by belief of the truth, sanctification of the Spirit by belief of the truth. Are you listening to this? Isn't this good? This is, well, hello there. How are you doing? Amen. I didn't see Brother Rex's mom over there until just now. And she's agreeing with me. That's why I saw it. Every once in a while, I'll get somebody that agrees. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Amen. So it's what Jesus Christ has done already. Let me show you something else. Uh, now, I'm going to go back to 1 Thessalonians, but go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Talking about salvation begins with God, born in the very heart of God. There's just some verses that I used to read over when I was um, uh, in church, but just not really sure of my salvation and, uh, you know, just thinking I was saved because somebody told me I was saved. Then I found out, according to the Word of God, I wasn't saved. Then I finally trusted Christ as my Savior. But if you'll notice in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, the Bible said, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. I like that verse. If I stop right there, you say, well, sure he is. He's a Savior. He's my Savior. I believed him, and therefore he's my Savior. But what does the Bible say? He's the Savior of all men. And the Holy Ghost adds these last words that will really clarify what we're talking about here, especially of those that believe. Did you know that he was your Savior before you believed? What does a Savior do? Save you. When did he save you? At Calvary. I mean, he redeemed or rescued you at Calvary. When did the Lord redeem the world? Uh, and how did he redeem the world? By the shedding of his blood. Is he going to come back and shed his blood every time somebody asks him to redeem them? He's already done it once. He's not going to do it again. Amen. He's already done it once. He's already shed his blood and died on Calvary and satisfied a holy God. So now that I have trusted him as my Savior, I know now that he was my Savior before I trusted him. Just because he was my Savior doesn't mean I'm going to heaven. And I hope I'm not confusing you. If I am, stop me. He was my Savior. He was a Savior of the world. Therefore, it, it, it goes back to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1 uh, that we were reading about uh, the election of God. Beloved, your election of God. But God elected the world to go to heaven by believing what Jesus Christ has done on Calvary is sufficient for everyone to go to heaven. Can you see that? Yeah, so so um, now not only am I elected uh, as far as to receive, and that's not, and, and I want to stop because I'm getting some blank stares out there. We're, does, does people here know what I mean when I talk about Calvinism and election and predestination? Did you know that Calvinists teach that God predestined this side to go to hell and this side to go to heaven? And then when the question is asked to Calvinists, well, why do you preach to people? They say, because we don't know who is elected. That's, that's, not, that's not in the Bible. It's nowhere to be found in the Bible. The whole world is elected to believe God and go to heaven. But what if they don't believe God? What happens? They die and go to hell. So we see right here, we not only see uh, the, uh, the sovereignty of God, but we see the free will of man. Man has to choose to believe God. And so what's our responsibility? to keep preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, let me show you something else. Go over to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I like verse 2. And he, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins... And not for ours only. When he says ours, who's he talking about? Save people. He's a propiti propitiation means satisfactory sacrifice. He satisfied the demands of a holy God. He satisfied the law, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Jesus said, yes, sir. He is 
the propitiation. He is already past tense. When did he become our propitiation? At Calvary. Now, we know it was before the world began, but it came to fruition. It actually, he died for our sins and paid for our sins with his blood on Calvary 2,000 years ago. So, he has redeemed the world, but it's not effectual until you believe it. Now, it's, uh, it's effectual to the world, but it's not effectual to you personally until you believe it. You see, that, that's the free will of man. The sovereignty of God, it's already done, but you're going to have to make a choice. Why do you think we drill salvation so much here at the Faith Baptist Church? Because you know what I believe? You know what I really believe? I believe in the years that I've pastored, 35 years that I've pastored. I've pastored in Tennessee, Georgia, Mississippi, and Florida. Did you know that everywhere I go, everywhere I've pastored, we have preached a simple gospel, and people say, I've never heard that before. In Baptist churches. Baptist church, never heard that before. And we've seen preachers get saved, missionaries get saved, deacons get saved, deacon and their wives, church members get saved. And let me tell you something. If, if, if you're struggling with your salvation, you couldn't be in a better place to get some help. To get some help. Anyway, let's go on right here. He's a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The whole world, not only for ours, but the sins of the whole world. Did you ever, did you mean Charles Manson's sins were taken care of on Calvary? Yes, sir. Surely not Hitler's. He's a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, if Hitler or Charles Manson would have trusted Christ as their Savior, they could have went to heaven. Now, I don't know that they didn't, but I don't believe they did, but I, I, you know, all I can, all we can do is preach to people, isn't it? All we can do is preach to people. Anyway, let's go on back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. They were a saved people. Salvation begins with God in the very heart of God. Um, John chapter number 15, verse number 16 says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Ephesians chapter, well, I said 1 Thessalonians, but I do have to turn over here to, to clarify myself a little bit. Look at Ephesians 1, 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now notice this. It fits right here. Verse 5 in Ephesians 1. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Look at verse 11. In whom, we all, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Did you know it's predestined that we ought to be, as a child of God, we ought to be a, to the praise of His glory? Did you know it's predestined that a child of God is going to receive a glorified body? So I have no problem with predestination, do you? You see, Calvinists just twit, just because people take that word and run it in a ditch does not mean that you and I should quit talking about it or should quit talking about it. It's in the Word of God. We need to, we need to read it and, and, and bring it out like it says. Back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, they were a saved people. Salvation begins with God. Long before man or the universe was ever created, salvation was ordained. Amen. It was, it was already fixed. Salvation involves faith. If you'll notice in verse number 5 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So salvation involves faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You don't have to muster up faith. Salvation involves faith. Well, then how do I get faith? Read the word of God. What if people don't believe the word of God? Read it to them anyway. Preach it anyway. I mean that. Preach it to them anyway. The Word of God that we read and preach creates the faith that you need to believe God. Did you know the faith that we have today 
We live by the faith of him who loved us and gave himself for us. I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the very faith that God gives me comes from the very word of God. Every day of my life, the faith to believe him. I read the word of God and I believe it. I didn't know what I believed about the word of God. I didn't, I didn't know. I was in that generation that came up where everybody was shooting peace signs. And uh, then we got, on the, we got on the monkey trail, you know, thinking we came from monkeys. And, we, well, you know, they taught it to us in, in school, in secular school. We, we, so I, Brother Donnell coined me one day. I said, that's what I was. He said I was a theistic evolutionist. I believed in evolution, but I believe God had some kind of hand in it somewhere. Until I got in the, you know what I did? I got in the Word of God. And the more I, the more I read the Word of God, the more, the, the more I saw how foolish man's ideas are. That's what I saw. How foolish man's ideas are. I found out God created everything just like it is. It took him six days to do it. Why it didn't, you know, why it took him six days, I don't know, but it did. And uh, according, to, according to what I can find in Bible revelation and Bible truths, this old mud ball we're living on is not uh, hardly over 6,000 years old. And the evidence supports it. And, and the evidence supports it. <laughs> Amen. So, I mean, just believe God. And did you know the very word created that faith? I thought, man, alive with all of this, over 1,500 years of 60-some-odd authors writing it, and not one contradiction in this wonderful King James Bible, not one contradiction. People's tried to say there's a contradiction, apparent contradiction, but there's not. There's not. I thought, how in the world could a mere man write something like that? If I started here with Keith and I told Keith, whispered something in Keith's ear, he turned around there to Brian and went on and on to Gavin all the way back to, that's Doc. I said, are you a real doctor? He said, no, that's his name, no, Doc. It went on to Doc and it went all the way around. It came back over here to Miss King. I guarantee you it'd be something different. But 1,500 years and over 60 authors, it all says the same thing. Jesus Christ died to save sinners. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a wonderful message? That's a, such a good message. Anyway, back in, um, back in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Salvation begins with God. Salvation involves faith. Salvation involves the Trinity. Now, who said this morning that the Trinity is not mentioned in Scripture? Was that Brother Paul that said that? I can't find the word Trinity, but I can see the Trinity. I can see the triune Godhead. I can see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same that was in the, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14 of John 1, And the Word was made flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, God living in me, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy, the Trinity is involved in our salvation. If you'll notice in verse number four, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Um, uh, well, back up to verse three, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So we see both human responsibility and divine sovereignty are taught in Scripture. Salvation's results, and this is where I'm going to close right here. I'm not going to get too far in 1 Thessalonians tonight, but uh, salvation's results. What are salvation's results? So, and don't be afraid to say it. Sometimes um, there's nobody, there's no one... I don't know if I'm using my English right. Brother Donnell has to tell me. There's no one that believes in grace any more than I do. I believe in grace. But you have some of these grace people that say that we should keep sinning that grace may abound. And, and what does Romans chapter 6 say about that? God forbid. So let me, let me get that down already. I believe in grace. Grace, what, if it wasn't for God's grace, we'd be doomed and damned for eternity. Amen. Grace. God's unmerited favor toward us. Mercy is God not doing to us what we deserve. I'm right, aren't I? Yeah. 
God doing, God doing to us what we do not deserve is grace. God not doing to us what we do deserve is mercy. So we got grace and mercy. But nevertheless, let me show you the results of salvation. Now, I didn't say the proof of salvation. I said results of salvation. So that'll clear up some, some misunderstanding, won't it? Results of salvation is a changed life. Did y'all get that? Woo, I'm on dangerous ground, ain't it, Brother Dewey? Changed life. I didn't say the proof of salvation. The proof of salvation is found in 1 John chapter number 5 and also Romans chapter number 8. God's Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God is what the Bible says. That's what it says. Clear as day. Proof of salvation. Results of salvation is a changed life. Um, look at verse 3 again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. Notice verse 7. Verse 7. How are you going to do this without good works? So that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. How were they in samples? You know what I found? I found that you can talk truth and you might get persecuted. But if you live truth, you will be all that speak truth shall suffer persecution. What does it say? All that live godly. All that live godly shall suffer persecution. What's the result of sanctification? What's the result of holiness? What's the result of justification? It's good works. We are created in Ephesians 2.10. We're created in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2.10. We are created unto good works is what the Bible says. Results are a change life. Now look at verse 9 and 10 of chapter 1. For they themselves show us of what manner of entering in we had unto you, how you turn to God from idols. How do I know that the believers in Thessalonica turned to God from idols? They turned to God from idols. <laughs> it's pretty clear, isn't it? That's real profound. They showed it. They showed it with their life. So the result, I didn't say proof. And I know I'm being recorded. I know I'm on YouTube and somebody's going to try to, um, to, to say I said something. So here it is. It's the results of salvation. Not proof of salvation. If I get up here and tell you I'm saved, how do you know I'm saved? Just because I say so? I want to see you. Say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. All right, and if you'll notice, they, uh, there in verse number, number uh, 10, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Did you know the, the incentive for holiness too right here in 1 Thessalonians is knowing the Lord's going to come back? And if we read on in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse number 13, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you saw or not, even as others which have no hope. For if you believe that Christ died and rose again, even so them which believe are, will Christ bring with him when he comes in the clouds and so on. I'm, look at it, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He's coming in the clouds and the dead in Christ are going to rise. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. And the Bible says we're going to be saved from the wrath to come. Wrath to come. When does God's wrath begin to be poured out? Tribulation period. When in the tribulation period? Middle? Right after the rapture. When, when does the wrath poured out on Gentile nations? Re you'll read it. Revelation 6. That's, so the church has to be taken out before the Antichrist can be revealed. So you see, it's all right. In one little chapter, in ten verses, it's just full of truth, isn't it? Well, anyway, that's all I have for you tonight.
we may pick up a little bit more on First Thessalonians next Sunday night. Yes, sir. I've got a question for the Calvinist preacher. 